Hi everyone and thanks for joining us today for our training webinar Getting Started with Sparkle. Before we start, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping notes. If you are experiencing any audio or technical issues, please try logging back out and logging in again. You can dial into the webinar via phone or through your computer. This webinar is being recorded and a copy of it along with the slides will be sent to you within 24 to 48 hours. You can ask questions during the presentation, however, we'd like to hold from answering them until the end of the session. So let me start by introducing myself. My name is Evren Siren. I'm a co-founder of Stardog Union and the chief scientist. I've been working on semantic technologies and knowledge graphs since early 2000s and participated in the standardization efforts for these technologies over the years. In this training, you will learn the basics of the RDF graph model and see how to build a simple Sparkle query step by step. We will cover more advanced Sparkle features and in the end, I'll show you Stardog Sparkle extensions to find short paths. Before we get into the technical details of RDF and Sparkle, I'll spend just a few minutes to give you a high level motivation for knowledge graphs in general and why RDF and Sparkle is the most suitable technology for them. During the training, we will write and execute Sparkle queries live that you can try on your own afterwards. At, and at the end, we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Okay, for the motivation, I'd like to talk about what we think is the most important problem knowledge graphs address, the data silo problem in the enterprise. As most of you know, organizations have been built to manage data by department and type. These disconnected, disconnected data sources can be used within the context of the department or the application that created it. But most strategic questions in the enterprise can be answered only when you have a unified view over all the data sources. And that's where we can use knowledge graphs to connect data from multiple sources without moving or copying. In Stardog, we use RDF graphs to unify structure, semi-structure, and unstructured data and query the unified view using Sparkle to support tasks like business analytics, machine learning, and more. Since Sparkle is a very powerful query language, we also support other query languages like GraphQL by translating those queries to Sparkle first. But why do we say RDF graphs are good for this problem? First of all, graphs are a generic data representation model. Graphs generalize not only the table structures you find in relational databases, but they are also a strict superset of the tree structures XML and JSON use to represent nested objects. With graphs, we can utilize the connectedness inherent to the data by linking entities with edges. This kind of linking makes it easy to compose disjoint graphs into a connected one. We won't really talk about this in detail today, but you can also have decorative and reusable models associated with your RDF graphs to do validation or inference. But maybe more importantly, RDF graphs are schema flexible. This means on the one extreme, you can have an RDF graph without an explicit schema and just have some nodes and edges. On the other ex extreme, you can have a strict model that prescribes a specific graph shape. Based on your use case, you can move between these two extremes. Finally, RDF, Sparkle and related technologies are based on standards developed in a vendor neutral way by organizations like W3C. So you can take your data and queries with you to any system that supports these standards. Now let's dive into the technical details and start with RDF graphs. <coughs> Here's an example RDF graph, a small snippet from a larger music data set. In a graph, we have nodes representing entities and edges that represent relationships between those entities. In this graph, we have a node representing the band The Beatles, nodes representing its members, one of their studio albums, and a song for, from that album. The nodes have identifiers telling us which entity they represent, and each edge also has an identifier that tells us what kind of relationship holds between those 
nodes. For example, the member edge uh, links the bands to its members. There is a special built-in edge identifier that you see here, RDF type, that links entities to special nodes that represent classes. The Beatles node has the type band, John Lennon node has the type solo artist, and so on. In this graph, we also have nodes depicted in green, representing data type values such as strings, numbers, and dates. For example, we see that the length of the La Midu song is 125 seconds, the release date of Please Please Me album is March 22, 1963. So you can have an RDF schema that describes the classes and the kind of edges you can use between those classes. You can organize the classes in a hierarchy. The schema itself is an RDF graph too, and here we are looking at a simplified uh, version of the schema. As I mentioned before, the schema is optional and this schema is not needed for any of the Sparkle queries we will see today. I wanted to show you this picture quickly since we will use these terms in our Sparkle queries. But as you can see, we are using a very simple model here to make our examples easier to understand. So RDF has a special terminology to refer to the nodes and edges in a graph. An edge is called a triple because each edge has three components. The source node for the edge is called the subject, the target node is called the object. The edge identifier specifying the kind of the relationship is the predicate. The identifiers used for predicates are called properties. So member is a property that's used in the pre predicate position of this triple we see here. And formally, an RDF graph is defined as a set of triples. So I already mentioned the two different kinds of nodes in our example RDF graph. The nodes with identifiers are called IRIs, and IRIs are also used to identify the predicates. The nodes that represent primitive values are called literals. There is also the notion of blank nodes, but they typically cause problems in practice, so we will ignore them for now. So IRIs are, IRIs are an important part of RDF, and one of the things that help us with the data unification problem I mentioned before. IRIs are a generalization of URLs we use every day as links on the web. The original use case for RDF stemmed from identifying resources on the web. And most of the IRIs you see in practice are actual URLs, but this is not a requirement of RDF. There is a specification about the syntax of IRIs that defines many other kinds of IRIs and tells us the rules for how to write a valid IRI. So one rule, for example, is you cannot have a space in an IRI. As long as your IRI conforms to those rules, you can use IRIs that are not URLs like the ones you see here. The only thing that matters for an IRI is that it has to be globally unique. So for HTTP URLs, the naming authority is clear. As the owners of stardog.com domain, we can coin the IRIs in that domain. But you can come up with different kind of namespaces that are not URLs to ensure this kind of uniqueness. So since IRIs are long and not very human friendly, when we write them in RDF and Sparkle, we shorten them by using a prefix. Here we are declaring the prefix RDF for this long built-in RDF namespace. Then the prefix name RDF colon type represents the IRI that is the concatenation of that namespace with the local name type. So instead of this long IRI, we can always use this prefix name instead. So in RDF and Sparkle, literals are writ written in quotes followed by the data type IRI. Just like other IRIs, data type IRIs can be written as prefix names too. The XSD prefix you see here denotes the namespace for the XML schema data types, where many commonly used data types are defined. The data type IRI can be omitted for strings, so the two string literals you see here in the middle are equivalent. 
And for some data types like integers, you can omit the quotes too, so you can just write the number as is without anything, any additional symbol. Okay, when it comes to serializing RDF triples, we write them by simply writing the subject, predicate, and object followed by a column. You need the prefix declarations as well, but if you are using Stardog, these prefixes are stored in the database metadata, so you don't have to type these declarations in your queries or data files. I'll just note here that an empty string can be defined as a prefix, and that's called the default namespace. So we have, here we have stardog.com slash tutorial as the default namespace. So any prefix name that starts with the colon belongs to this default namespace. Okay, now we are ready to talk about Sparkle queries. The basic building block for Sparkle queries is triple patterns. A triple pattern is just like a triple, but you can use a variable in one of the three positions, in any one of the three positions. We use triple patterns to find the matching triples in a graph, and variables act like wildcards that match any node in the graph. So the main query form in Sparkle is a select query. Select queries by design look like SQL queries. And just like SQL queries, we have uh, first the uh, select variables in the query and then there's a query body that contains the triple patterns to match. Select query results is a table where each selected variable shows up as a column and each pattern match shows up as a row. Now let's see these Sparkle queries in action and learn what more we can do with Sparkle. But before I start, let me mention that all the data and the queries we will be using today are available in our GitHub repository. So you can get these examples on your computer and try them on your own later. Uh, I'm now switching to the Stardog Studio application, which is the IDE we use to talk to a Stardog database. So here we are seeing the triples that corresponds to the bit, uh, corresponds to the Beatles graph that we have seen before. And I just added a couple more triples at the end to, to define additional al solo albums released by the Beatles members. And by clicking add button, I can add these triples to our database that I created before. And now I'm going to open the directory that contains our example Sparkle queries and we'll start with a very simple example that has a single triple pattern. So this triple pattern is matching all the triples where the predicate is RDF type, the object is album and subject can be anything. And when we run this query we get three results back. Uh, which are the bindings for the album based on the triples in our graph. So let me mention a couple different ways we can simplify the syntax of the query. So for example, if there is nothing following our uh, triple pattern, uh, we don't have to use the period at the end. Uh, RDF type, since it's a very commonly used uh, property, there is a special shortcut in RDF and Sparkle to use just the letter A, so you can read it as album is an album. Um, so we can use A instead of RDF type. The var keyword is optional for select queries, so I don't have to type it. And also, if we are selecting all the variables in the query, we can use the asterisk as a wildcard to return all those bindings. So when I run this version of the query, I get back the same result. It's just slightly different syntax. So now let's add one more triple pattern to this query, which will get the artist edges for the albums. When I run it, I still get three results. Uh, where we are finding all the artist nodes connected to the albums through the artist edge. 
If I add one more triple pattern here to say that all the artists return should uh, should have RDF type solo artist. Now we'll see that we are getting only two results instead of three because the Beatles album uh, uh, does not satisfy the solo artist condition. It's the artist is a band. So you can think of these triple patterns as joins. So we get three results from the first two patterns. Then we intersect those results with the re uh, results of the third triple pattern. And as a result, we got only two uh, matching uh, rows in the square. Okay, so let's get the albums, the artists and the dates, uh, the release dates for those albums in this next query. So now we are seeing the dates associated with the albums. And another way to simplify the query syntax is when you have uh, triple patterns or triples with the same subject, uh, instead of using the period to separate them, you can use the semicolon. And when you use the semicolon, you can uh, you just omit the subject for the next triple and directly start with the predicate and object. And you can use the semicolon as many times as necessary. And when all the triple patterns with the same subject finish, you can use the period at the end as before. Or in this case, you can omit the period because uh, there's nothing else in our query and now we get the same results as before. Now I'll switch to a slightly larger version of this music data set, one we have created from DBpedia. DBpedia itself is a data set created by extracting structured information from Wikipedia. And we have a small subset of Wikipedia data here. So the same query for album and artist is returning uh, more than 1000 results and one thing we notice right away is uh, the results are completely randomly ordered uh, uh, here because by default there's no ordering condition for the query results uh, we can use the order by keyword to say that we want the results to be ordered by date so now you can see that all the albums are returned based uh, sorted by their release dates and so one thing you might think looking at this the number of results returned is we have uh, these many albums in our data set uh, but there's nothing that prevents an album to have multiple artists associated with it or multiple dates associated with it for example since DBP is uh, semi-automatically created uh, looks like it associates two different release dates with this Rolling Stones album as a result there are two different triples matching this pattern and we get duplicated results so uh, we can use constraints to say there might there can be at most one date value associated with an album but uh, without any kind of constraints or scheme associated with the graph, uh, any property might have multiple values for a node. So we'll see some Sparkle features that would help us to find these kind of things, get rid of duplicates in a minute. Uh, but let's first uh, see some other features such as limiting the results return. So for example, we can, now I change the ordering condition to be descending. So we see the most recent albums and limiting the results to two so that we are seeing only the most recent two albums we have in the data set. As you can see, we don't have uh, up-to-date album information here. Uh, you can also define an offset to say you want to skip the first 10 results, let's say, and then get the next two so you can do some kind of paging with this uh, feature. You'll notice that I used uh, Studio's 
autocomplete feature here and it used lowercase uh, keyword sparkle is not case sensitive so you can mix and match the case you use if you prefer lowercase you can use that or you can stick to uppercase uh, there are uh, ways to filter the query results. You can use a filter keyword uh, to exclude some of the results. Uh, so the filter keyword uh, is followed by these parentheses and a filter condition. So Sparkle has lots of built-in comparison uh, operators and functions that you can use for example you can say date should be greater than or equal to uh, January 1st 1970 so the earliest one we are earliest album we are getting is released after that date uh, you can use a function like year so year is a built-in sparkle function when applied to a date returns the year component so we can apply this function and then compare the return integer with 1970. So effectively we are running the same query uh, but using this year function. Um, and you can also assign function values, function results to a variable. So for example, we can use the bind keyword to say that the output of the year function should be assigned to a new variable uh, called year and then we can use the year variable in our filter condition again this is the same query uh, written in a different way uh, but if you have lots of functions in your uh, filters then using introducing these variables can increase readability understandability uh, in your queries so we can also use Sparkle to query what kind of uh, data we have in the database. So for example, now we know what kind of classes and properties used in this uh, database. But if we were, we didn't know uh, this ahead of time and uh, want to learn what kind of classes are used as types in this database we could run a query that will match all the rdf type triples in the database of course when we write it like this it will return all the uh, node iris in addition to the types used in this uh, data which we are not interested in so right now we are just trying to find the types used so i can change the select condition so we are only seeing the types, but it doesn't change the fact that we will get one result for each matching triple in the graph. So if we want to see all the results without any duplicates, we need to use the distinct keyword. And when we use a distinct keyword, all the rows in the resulting table will be different from each other. So now we are seeing the six classes used as types in our graph. Uh, you can use similar queries to find properties or other characteristics of the data. And we can also do uh, aggregation uh, to compute results over uh, aggregated uh, solutions. So the simplest aggregation we can do is counting the number of results in a query. So at the beginning, we ran this query to retrieve all the album instances. Now what we are doing is applying the count function to the result of this query. So the result of the query is a table. The count function will return the number of rows in that table and will bind that uh, to a variable called count. Now we are seeing the number of distinct album instances in our music database. Uh, we can use the uh, min and max functions, for example, to find the earliest release date and the uh, most recent release date we have. 
So in this case, the mean function looks at the date column in the result table and returns the minimum value and also the maximum value here. So we can also define a group by uh, a grouping condition. So by default, the select query returns one table as a result. With a group by, we can partition these tables such that each table will have the same year value uh, for its result. So in the selection condition, we are selecting the albums, dates and their years. And then we are grouping those results by the year. And now when we apply the count uh, aggregate, function to this query it's going to count the number of results in each group separately and then we'll get the number of albums for each year uh, as a result of the query so there were 31 albums in 97 and so on we ordered the results by descending uh, counts for each year it's also possible to uh, use a select query inside another select query for example so this query is the previous one we used to find the number of albums in each year and suppose we want to find the average number of albums for all the years so we can take this table as one result and use uh, pass it to another aggregation function to see that in average, there's 18.55 albums for each year in our data set. Okay, so these queries are getting a little bit complicated. Let's go to some simple examples again to explore other Sparkle features. So this query returns the songs in our uh, database so there is 3749 uh, uh, songs in the data uh, I'm going to add another uh, triple pattern to get the lengths associated with these songs now we are seeing the length return for each uh, song but you, know, you might notice that the number of results decreased because it turns out, since against our data is not perfect, some of the songs are missing the length information. There is no length uh, uh, property associated with some of the song nodes. So if that's the case, we can use an optional block to say that a triple some of the triple patterns in our query can are optional so uh, in this version of the query we will find all the songs and if there exists a length uh, edge associated with those nodes we'll get them as a result of the query now we are again getting all the songs as a result of our query so if we scroll down a little bit we'll see that some of the songs are returned without any length so if our goal was just to see these uh, songs without any length we can define add a filter condition and one of the filter uh, functions in sparkle is testing if a variable is bound or not so what this query does is just like the previous one it finds the songs and optionally their length but then it filters anything for which the length was found. So when I run this query, I'll get back all the query, uh, all the songs for which there is no length uh, information. So there's 109 such songs. Uh, but if our goal is finding patterns that don't exist in the graph, then there's a much easier way to do it. So there is a special filter uh, we can use, not exist filter, uh, inside which we write one or more triple patterns to say that 
I want to find the songs for which this triple pattern does not exist in the graph. So this will return the same results as before, uh, but it's uh, more easier to write and more understandable. Now let's uh, look at the writers of songs and specifically the co-write relationship. So in our uh, data, we have some songs that have multiple writers. So now we have a query that's finding the co-writer pairs. So we have a pattern that matches a song with a, its writer and another pattern to match the writer. Uh, and we also want these two matches to be different from each other. So just because we are using a different variable doesn't mean uh, the, those variables will bind to distinct values. So we add this filter. And since we are not interested in songs, we are finding the distinct pair of artists and co-writers that have worked on one or more songs together. So in the results, we see the pairs are returned in uh, twice in different order and we can filter those out uh, but what we, I want to focus on something else so uh, I'd like to talk about property paths in Sparkle where you can combine the patterns in different ways to uh, explore the graph so one of the property path expressions you can write is the inverse path. So normally when we have a triple pattern, it matches the subject, predicate and object uh, in the same direction as the edge in the graph. But if I add this caret symbol in front of a predicate, this uh, changes the order of the match. So now what I put in the subject of this triple pattern will match the object of the triple and for the object it will match the subject. So to kind of keep the same uh, query, what I will do is switch the order of the subject variable and object variable. So now this is still the same query, it's finding the co-writers, uh, but written in a slightly different way. So now what we have is two triple patterns where the object of one pattern is the same as the subject of the other one. So in these cases, we can use a sequence path. So we can basically uh, omit the subject and the object and combine these two triple patterns with this slash symbol. Now the query is doing exactly the same thing. Uh, and what the way we can read it is we start with an artist node, uh, follow the writer edge in the reverse direction, and then follow the writer edge in the same direction as in the data and reach the co-writer node. And we still have the filtering and the distinct applied here. So we can add, for example, an additional filter condition saying that we want to start with the Paul McCartney uh, node and find Paul McCartney's co-writers. So we get nine results as uh, the output of this query. But we can go further than this. So we can have recursive paths so that we can not find the direct uh, co-writers of Paul McCartney, but follow their co-writers and find the co-writers of co-writers and continue like this. So these recursive paths are uh, written with the plus symbol following a previous uh, property path expression. So now we are saying start with the Paul McCartney node, follow this writer edges to reach a co-writer and this plus symbol says we need to keep uh, continuing uh, uh, 
keep uh, following these patterns once we reach the core writer. So for example, starting with Paul McCartney, we'll reach Elvis Costello, and we'll find Elvis Costello's core writers and so on and so forth. So if I run this query now, I'm getting 996 results. So there are lots of songwriters that uh, can be reached when we start with Paul McCartney and start uh, uh, exploring the core writers. Uh, here we also see the limitation of property paths because while we are getting all these results, uh, we don't really see how Paul McCartney is connected to these nodes in the graph. What are the intermediate co-writers that gets us from Paul McCartney to these other nodes? So that's one of the reasons we created this uh, Sparkle extension that we call Path Queries. And Path Queries has a slightly different syntax. So instead of select, we start with saying uh, we are looking for paths. Uh, you specify a start condition which could be unbounded or we can say we want the starting node to be Paul McCartney and here the end node is unrestricted so we'll start with Paul McCartney then follow this path described here which is the same property path expression as before so we are starting with Paul McCartney finding its co-writers and recursively continue doing that and when I run this query, we will get not only uh, all the core writers we can recursively reach from Paul McCartney, but we also see all the intermediate uh, people. So Paul McCartney wrote, co-wrote a song with Michael Jackson, who co-wrote a song with Rodney Jerkins, and it goes on like this. So you get Justin Bieber, Drake, so on. So there are eight more than eight thousand different paths we can find uh, looking at the co-writer relationships the one thing i was curious about when i looked at these results was can i find a path starting from paul mccartney and to someone that's quite different like kanye west so if i just specify the end condition now what the query will do is it will find the paths starting from Paul McCartney note going to Kanye West, which in this case starting with Michael Jordan, uh, Michael Jackson. Uh, so like in the second result, we see Lil I Am, James Brown, and then we reach Kanye West. We are still missing something in these query results, which is the song that these people co-wrote together because there's no binding for the song in these uh, queries. So to get the songs, we need to go back to the original pattern we wrote. So we need to have explicit triple patterns that match song to the artist and the co-writer. So the rest of the query is the same path queries, starting node and node, but the matching condition has this explicit song variable so when I execute this now, uh, I can click the C bindings here and see the song that uh, the nodes, these artists work together. So this way we are not only recursively following the uh, co-writer relationships through the graph, but we are also seeing at every step uh, which song that they worked on together. Okay, so other than select and pet queries, there are other uh, query types in Sparkle. Uh, so there's, for example, a simple S query, which is uh, similar like as select. There's a pattern that we are matching possibly with filters and other constructs, but the result of the S query is just a Boolean. Uh, which might, uh, which is more efficient than getting all the results and seeing if the results are empty or not. Um, another query form in Sparkle is the construct query. 
So the construct query again the matching conditions are similar except um, the result of a construct query is an RDF graph. So instead of a table we are getting a graph as a result. So in this case we are matching the triples with the band type and their members and then the result of the construct is basically those triples. Uh, with the construct query, you can actually change the transform the graph that you are matching. So here we are matching the bands and members, but we can say the result of the query should be a different kind of graph where the matched members uh, have this type band members. For example, we want to update our uh, data set with this new type that we want to introduce so we can create these new triples as a result of our construct query so match a portion of the graph with the where clause and uh, output a different kind of uh, graph as a result uh, this just returns the uh, results here so you can save it to a file send it over to someone else or something like that if you want to actually uh, insert these results back into your graph then you use the insert query so now instead of a read-only query we are updating the graph uh, in this case by simply adding these additional triples and if we want to delete some triples uh, we can use uh, delete queries. So what we have here is in the where clause we are matching songs with their lengths which are expressed in seconds. Then we are using this expression here to turn it into a XML schema day type day time duration which is which is a specialized data type for representing durations. And we are deleting the uh, triples where the length is expressed as seconds and instead inserting the value with the uh, daytime duration. So we are basically modifying the uh, range of this property from an integer to a daytime duration to be more explicit about uh, what kind of values are expected here. So if I run this query, all these values will be updated so I can go back to our previous query where we ran, uh, where we got the length of the uh, songs and now we see that all the results are coming back as daytime duration values. Okay, so we covered a lot of Sparkle features but there's actually more that we haven't had uh, we didn't have time to cover today so as I mentioned at the beginning you can go to our tutorials repository to get the data and the queries and also check out the other tutorials we have on our website uh, to learn more about RDF Sparkle and related technologies uh, you can download Stardog and Stardog Studio to try the queries uh, that we have seen today or tried uh, some of the other features like mapping relational data sources to RDF. So to wrap up today we've seen the basics of the RDF graph model. We saw how to build a simple Sparkle query and looked at some of the advanced features in Sparkle. So hopefully now you have a better idea about RDF and Sparkle and start writing your own queries. Okay, on that note, uh, we are ready to start the Q&A session and we'll try to answer some of your questions.